But the point is, and we're going to see that she delayed, in doing all this, pro in this process, it delayed her opening the door. Solomon just want her to get up and come open the door. But to her, she want to get herself fixed up. She want to get herself right. She going to, to present herself before her beloved, and she wants to be right. But Solomon, just, just come open the door. Okay? I'm not saying that either one of them is wrong, but I'm just saying that for some of us in our relationships, we have these little things that come up where one may just, just want you to do the basic, just come open the door. The other one may want to want to fix them, prepare themselves to fix to open the door, and this is the, the thing that they have going on. Ah! Feel free to come and be a part of our services. Praise the Lord, everybody! Come on, let's give God a hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord this morning to give him praise, glory, and honor. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited about being in the house of the Lord one more time. You may be seated for a few minutes. We honor the Lord, first of all, today for being here. And we thank each and every one of you that has uh, came out to the uh, church this morning. And also we give God praise and glory and honor for all of those who are getting us on streamlining. And however they are getting us, we do thank God for them because people, God is awesome. God has blessed us and we thank God for all his rich blessings. And I thank God again for each and every one of you. We're going to have a time today praising the name of the Lord because it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Again, we thank God. And I do want to thank God and thank you because this year we've done some things in the ministry that, that we haven't uh, uh, done before. We always had our Christmas program. We always had our Easter program. But we never had a Mother's Day program. But this year we had some people that got together and they wanted to have a Mother's Day program. And, and they did, and it was excellent. I thank God for all the hard work, all the dedication, and I thank God for all the decoration. Praise the Lord, done by uh, Sister Phelps. And I do thank God for Sister Jennifer Walton. Because she did something that was unique. She took her own money, and she bought baskets for all of the uh, preachers, the past, me, the preacher's wife, and some of the other people in the church. She did that with her own money. And we ought to thank her. Oh, she had that whole, whole pew lined up with baskets that she gave because she wanted to do it. And I give God the praise and the glory and everything. I thank God for each and everything that all y'all do. But this was special. And the tea light and candles, we have never, ever had that before. But we did it this time. And it, it, it's for uh, the members of this body. God has blessed us. It's not many of us, but we do things for one another. And I thank you all for putting your time in, for putting your decoration and everything in here, and for getting all this together, because you didn't have to do it. This is something that we have not been doing. But I thank God that we had some people in here that wanted to do it. I didn't ask them to do it. They asked me, could they do it? And you know I'm always up for something good. 
And I just want to let them know I appreciate it. And also I appreciate uh, the Lord for, praise God, our graduation celebration. We have never had a program for the graduates, but God enabled us to have one for the graduates this year. And I thank God for all five of them that graduated from college and high school. And I just give God the praise and the glory and the honor that this church body were able to do unto them. Because God is a giver. And we are just like Jesus. We like to give too. And I thank each and every one of you that had a part in this giving. And it's going to be shown today on TV for the first time on the Pentecostal Revival Hour. It'll be shown today. We have never, ever done this before. And I thank God for allowing us to reach out and touch someone. And I thank God for all our young people. I thank God for them. I'm so thankful that they were able to make it through high school and those that uh, made it through college. I am thankful. And I appreciate it. And then we let them know that we appreciate uh, what they've done. And now we are looking forward to our Father's Day. Let's give God a hand of praise. We are going to have a Father's Day program honoring the fathers in the ministry and those fathers in here that was a part of the ministry that has gone on to be with the Lord. I thank God for them. I wish years and years ago that my father could have been a part, but my father is not a part. He was never a part of the ministry. He was never in the ministry because he had passed away before the ministry got started. But I thank God, I believe if he had lived, I believe that my father would have been a part of this ministry. I believe he would have, but my mother was. And I thank God for her coming on in, being a part of the ministry. And I just thank God for what God has done. And I thank God for the upkeep of the ministry, inside, outside, TV, everything. Because we are doing everything in-house. We have not hired out for anybody to do our closed capture, to do our, our, our TV programs or nothing like that. But the people in the ministry is doing it. And I thank God. I thank God for these men and women that are running these cameras. They're doing the best that they can do because they didn't go to school for this. They just got on the camera and started doing the best that they could do. And when I look at the Pentecostal Revival Island, and I look at the other, uh, 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 you know, church groups and everything, I think y'all doing pretty good. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for what you're doing. We're not going to be long the time. We're going to get ready. We're going into our devotional service today. Praise God, our system Pastor Walton is coming at this time. And as he comes, let's give God a hand of praise for a system Pastor Walton. God is good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's good all the time. Praise the Lord. This time I ask everyone to stand. Let us all bow our head and let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand of praise. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. As I walk through the door, I 
Let's give the Lord another hand. If you will, go ahead and get your Bibles. Hold them up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I believe what it says to believe. I come to the Lazella Pentecostal Church to be taught. The word of God. I will not serve the devil. I will not live in sin. Jesus Christ died for my sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. I am Christ like. I am born again. I have power over the devil. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen again. Let's give the Lord another hand. Oh, yes. And if you will, just bow your heads right where you are. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you glory, honor, praise, and worship. We want to say thank you for another chance to enter into your presence. We thank you for our life, our help. And our strength, we thank you mostly for your son, Jesus, coming into this world to die for our sins. 
We thank you for salvation. We thank you for all the times that you have healed our bodies. Lord, we pray right now as we go into your word that it is a word of salvation to the lost, a word of healing to the sick and the afflicted. We pray that every broken heart is mended by you. Lord, as we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen, amen, and amen once again. Let's give him one more hand. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we are blessed to be in the house of the Lord once again. Again, we thank God for everyone who is in the house. We thank those of you who will be viewing by television. We also thank God for those of you who are viewing the live stream. Again, we give God glory, honor, and praise for the things that he has done. We want to give honor to the founder of this ministry, Apostle Alva Phelps. We are continuing on in his legacy. He established this as being the ministry of faith and power. And we have and we are exhibiting that faith and power. It takes power to live this life godly. We can't do it alone. But we thank God for the Holy Ghost that has been given. We also thank God for our co-founder, Senior Pastor Phillips, being right there with him from the beginning in setting up this ministry, her assisting him. You know, we talked about that creation of woman this morning, Sunday school, and how that woman assisted Adam, made things better and easier for him. In like manner, that's what senior pastor did with Apostle Phelps as far as getting this ministry as to the point to where it is today. We also thank God for our other pastors being here this morning. Thank God for the pastor of the Forsyth Pentecostal Church, Pastor Willie Wooden along with his spouse. Thank God for them being in the service. I also want to honor the pastor of the Fort Valley Pentecostal Church, Pastor Lizzie Dennard. Thank God for her being here. Thank God for all the assistant pastors, all the other ministers of the gospel, all the deacons, saints, friends, visitors, and even enemies. Thank God for you too. That's when you know you have power. <laughs> when you don't let your enemies dissuade you in your walk with the Lord. Everyone is not happy about you being saved. So some people try to knock you down. But we thank God for giving us power over all the power of the enemy. Jesus had enemies. We know better than he is. All right, we're going to get ready to get back into it. We're in your favorite book, Song of Solomon. We will resume our study of this book. This is a key book that everyone should read and understand as far as relationships are concerned. When God blesses you with someone, you have to love and honor one another. And as we have read thus far, and I do encourage those of you who uh, may just be viewing this for the first time that our previous messages on this book are available on YouTube. So if you would go there, that's the easiest place to find it. Do a search for my playlist, Pastor Alex Phelps, 
And in that playlist, you'll be able to find the previous messages on Song of Solomon chapters 1 through 4. As I have told you many times that I, myself, am not an expert in this, but that we are all learning what we need to do in order to better ourselves and also better our, our relationships with our spouses. We know that Solomon was king. He was also wise. The Bible says he was one of the wisest men, if not the wisest man that ever lived. And we know that in the course of Solomon's life, he was involved with many women. But there was this one, this little Shulamite woman that he truly loved, and she loved him. And we have viewed in the past of how they express their love towards one another. If you are in a serious relationship with someone, both parties should be manifesting their love towards one another. Shouldn't be one-sided. But we see where Solomon and the Shulamite woman, in our reading previously, have manifested their love to one another. And as we conclude it in the fourth chapter, we see where the wedding feast has happened, wedding celebration, and now they have began to consummate the marriage. Now, one thing about marriage is everything is not going to be lovey-dovey all the time. There are going to be some disagreements there are going to be some misunderstandings. There are going to be some disappointments. And we're going to see as we go into chapter 5 an instance where even with Solomon and the Shulamite woman, well, they had a little disagreement. And I believe God has all this in the, in the book to show us fully what relationships are about. Again, your marriage, you, if some of us in here have been married, and there have been some times in our marriages where we wish we hadn't even met the person we married before. <laughs> but most of us get over that. But I'm just saying, there's some times where you're not going to really like that person. You may still love them, but you may not. It's a difference between liking someone and loving someone. Sometimes because of the decision one of the spouses make, the other spouse may be disappointed. And so we're going to see as we go into chapter 5, a little thing happens here, and we're going to see how it is handled. And by everyone in Song of Solomon chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading with verse 1, and it reads, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea. Drink abundantly, O oh beloved. So now this is Solomon. And towards the end of the fourth chapter, we see that he refers to a garden. And in this instance, the garden referred to the womb. So now Solomon has consummated the marriage in his first verse. And he is saying that he has gathered his mirror with his spice, eating the honeycomb with the honey, 
drunk my wine with my milk. Then he said, old friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. So, and I do have a reading that I have been reading from to help us understand this. And it's from the relevant Bible teaching. And the reading says, Solomon speaks of having consummated the marriage and having entered the garden. Talking about the womb. He says, in keeping with his early analogies and symbolism, that he enjoyed the garden. So he enjoyed his time with his spouse. I'm talking about sexually. Then what are you talking about? I mean, he, entered, he went in his garden, and he plucked his fruit, and he enjoyed it. Okay? So just, I'm just trying to make it plain so everyone can understand. Okay? Then he say, eat, friends, at the latter part of that verse. Oh, friends, drink, yay, yay, drink abundantly, oh, beloved. So he's telling his friends, if you have a relationship with your wife, have a good time with one another. You have a relationship with your spouse, your husband, have a good time with one another. Whenever you get married, the bed is undefiled. Have a good time with one another. Any question? <laughs> okay. So this is what he's talking about. He said, I ain't out of my God. I enjoy my God. You enjoy yours. Okay? Then he goes on in verse 2, it reads, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of night. I did have a, a little reading that I needed to, to um, do with the end of verse 1. It says, when it's talking about it, he's telling his friends to eat, to drink. So this is likely God speaking here, giving his blessing and approval to what they are doing. He tells them to indulge of the goodness and wonder of his idea of sexual intimacy. The word for friends should be, be better translated companions. God wants us to be overwhelmed and carried away with love, letting go, loving and enjoying his idea of sexual intimacy in marriage. We are to be consumed with pleasure, intimacy, love, and affection. The sights, the fragrant smells, the garments, the jewelry, and the romance all lead to a healthy and normal experience of intimacy in marriage. So again, this is getting back to the marriage. This is for married people now. You should be enjoying one another on an intimate level. All right, now getting back to verse 2, I'm going to read it again. It says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. So in verse 2, here is the beginning of our little dilemma. Our reading says, God is very realistic in the scriptures having highlighted the goods and bad of people. Not long after consummating of the marriage and perhaps even the same night, a conflict occurs. Soon into their marriage, perhaps even their first night together, she has a dream. She says she was sleeping, but her heart was awake, so she was probably in a very deep sleep. She hears a voice and is awakened by a knock on the door. For whatever reason, Solomon had to leave the bedroom and go outside. He was drenched with dew 
and wanted to be let back in. She hears him knocking and recognizes the voice of her beloved. So now, again, this dilemma is arising. Apparently, Solomon has went out for some reason. It doesn't tell the details of it. But he's trying to come back in. And he can't get in. Okay, so here she is. Again, she said that, that she was asleep, but her heart was awake. So she hears a voice of her beloved, which is Solomon, asking her to open the door. My sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So Solomon cannot get back in. And just like, and we're going to see, read, maybe I need to read it before I bring this out. But I will say this, me and sometimes we are, we are impatient. We want things to happen when we want it to happen. But let's go on and read verse 3. It says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Now, this is the Shulamite woman talking. She has gotten ready for night. She's not dressed. The custom was in that time is before you get in the bed, you wash your feet. She has washed her feet. And she doesn't want to get up. Because she's in for the night. And women, you know how some of you all are. You will not go to the door unless you right. And sometimes it takes you some time to get right. I'm talking about your hair got to be right. Your face has to be right. Clothes and everything has to be right. And sometimes that takes some time. So, but here Solomon is outside, knocking on the door. He wants to get in. But there's a delay. Sometimes we in our relationships, our wife or husband doesn't respond. When we want them to respond, and we begin to have a little feeling in there. So this is what is happening with them. So again... She has put, put off her coat. Then why I'm going to put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Then verse 4 said, My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. So this is her still speaking. Solomon can't get in, but apparently there is some type of lattice win window or something that he's able to put his hand in. The hole, but he can't open the door. And the, 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 the lady let him know that, hey, my, my boy, I love him now. I love him. And let me go ahead and, and do this little reading. It says, Solomon reached his hand through the opening to likely signal to her to come and open the door. Maybe he made some kind of gesture trying to show her that he missed her. The bottom line is that something aroused her feelings toward him, and she put fragrances on her fingers and hands, even spilling some onto the boat as she went to open the door. And I'm going to read verse 5. That's what that's going to bring that out. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh up on the handles of the lock. So she got up, and she began, and she want to be right. She want to put a smell good on. So she has it on her hands, fingers, and even dropped it some on the handles of the door lock. But the point is, and we're going to see that she delayed, in doing all this, pro in this process, it delayed her opening the door. Solomon just want her to get up and come open the door. But to her, she want to get herself fixed up. She want to get herself right. She going to, to present herself before her beloved, and she wants to be right. But Solomon, just, just come open the door. 
Okay? I'm not saying that either one of them is wrong, but I'm just saying that for some of us in our relationships, we have these little things that come up where one may just, just want you to do the basic, just come open the door. The other one may want to want to fix them, prepare themselves to, fix, to open the door. And this is the, the thing that they have going on. Okay? And then in verse 6 it reads, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So when she, by the time she got to the door, Solomon was impatient. So he left. Because it was taking her in his eye too long to come to the door. Okay? All right, so, so this is what happened in this situation. Again, she finally got up. She went to, to open the door. And when she opened the door, her beloved was gone. And we have a little reading that says, But in this delay he left her. And she longed for him, but could not find him. She called, but he did not answer. Perhaps he had been angry at her secondary delay, losing patience, and went to go and calm down somewhere. Perhaps she took so long that he thought she wasn't going to come or that she fell back to sleep. Either way, he left. Okay? So everybody see this? See this little dilemma that's going on? And I, again, I say in every relationship, you're going to have little things to happen. You're going to have little disputes, disagreements. So apparently Solomon got tired of waiting, and he left. We still in the Bible. Okay? So let's read them down and see what happened next. The watchman that went about the city found me. They smote me, they wounded me, the keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. So here she is, she goes out into the city at nighttime to try to find Solomon. And she has a little encounter with the watchman because it was dangerous. Cities back in that time had people that their job was at night time to watch. Watch out, see if you have any criminals, anything going on wrong. So apparently whoever this watchman was mis made a mistake in ident identifying her as a criminal. So the word said the watchman that went about the city, they found me, they smoked me, they wounded me, so they hurt her. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. And I'm quite sure whenever they did that, they knew they had messed up. So we have a little reading that says, Yet things got even worse as she searched for Solomon. She came upon some of the watchmen making their rounds in the city. She was covered with a shawl, so perhaps they didn't recognize her and thought that she was sneaking around as a prowler or a thief, perhaps as a spy or an enemy. They struck her, injured her, and took her shawl. Right, so now this all happened because Solomon was gone whenever she went to answer the door. Solomon would have been a little patient, waiting on her to answer the door. This never would have happened. But because he was impatient, and some, like I say, sometimes men, we are impatient. And by this happening, she went out to try to find him. Now here she is getting injured. Okay? Let's read on down. 
Verse 8 says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. This is still the Shulamite woman talking. So now she charges the daughters of Jerusalem that if they find him, tell him, I miss him, and I love him. Letting all the women know how she feel about Solomon. Then I read and it says, perhaps at this point, they recognize that she's the king's wife. And they let her go to be with some of the other women. She adjures them as adamantly as she wanted to emphasize that sex is only for marriage to tell him that she is love sick for him. She misses her beloved, and she wants that message conveyed to him wherever he is. So if someone she's telling, if, if you come across him, tell him that I love him, I miss him, and he need to come home. Okay? She's not ashamed of her feelings towards her mate. Then we have verse 9, it says, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than any other beloved that thou doest so charge us? And then it says, and I read it says, Clearly they are taken by her adoration, such as they ask her why she is so lovesick. In other words, why you love him so much? They want to know why she admires him so. They also comment on her beauty as being the most beautiful among women. Clearly Solomon could see that she was beautiful and her concern about her sun darkened skin was no big deal. It wasn't too difficult for Solomon to say and see that she had no blemishes. So again, here she is, this Shulamite woman. She's going out, talking to these daughters of Jerusalem, women of Jerusalem, and they begin to question, why you love me so much? They probably knew about Solomon's past, all of those relationships in the past that he had. So they're beginning to probably question her, why you love him so much? How you, how, do you know what he is? And she didn't. Solomon was a lover boy. So now she, these outside women are questioning her because they probably knew what type of person Solomon was. Solomon maybe didn't. And so they begin to question her, but we're going to see that does not deter her feeling towards Solomon. Sometimes you may have people on the outside of your marriage, and they try to say things to knock your spouse. Why you love him? Why you keep, why you keep putting up with her? Try to get you to break out, break up your marriage. And so, but we're going to see how she handles this. So this is what they're doing with her. Then we're going on to verse 10. It says, my beloved is white and ready. The chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the beryl. His belly is as bright 
ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So now she, whenever she began to be in question about why you love him so much, see how she handled this? She began to talk about all those good qualities of Solomon. Begin to tell these outside women that, hey, my beloved is white and ruddy, the cheapest among 10,000. We know that King David was described as ruddy. That means that they're handsome. And so she began to tell these women, that she began to tell them, tell them why she loves him. Getting to tell all these, sometimes you got to let folk know. Folks trying to get in between you and your spouse, just let them know them good qualities. This is why I love him, because he's handsome. He's the cheapest. I'm on 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy, talking about his hair, and black as a raven. They want to know why she loved him, she's telling them. Describing the beauty that she sees in Solomon. You ought not to be ashamed of the beauty and the qualities that you see within your spouse. Whenever the enemy, the devil, comes trying to attack your spouse, make you think twice about your spouse, you need to have some words for them. Tell them, hey, I love my spouse. You trying to talk and break up our relationship? That's a good person to me. And she began to tell the qualities. Say his head is like the most fine gold. His locks are like are bushy, as black as the raven. His eyes are like the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. Talking about how beautiful his eyes are. Then talking about his cheeks. Or as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the burl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphire. And again, I'm going to pause right there. I need to go back and hit some of this reading. So she immediately starts by describing his physical features, she is enraptured by his dazzling looks and ruddy complexion, like his father David in 1 Samuel 16 and 12. She said that he is outstanding, even if he was to be compared with 10,000 other men. Clearly, Solomon is most attractive and desirable to her. She loves his head his black hair, his tender eyes, the smell of his cheeks, and the taste of his kisses. She adores his hands, his abdomen, and his legs. His appearance is as ideal as a cedar tree, which was very important in the culture for building. She loves his kisses and says that he is wholly desirable. Just as Solomon has gone from head downward describing her beauty to her, she now tells of his extravagant appearance and love to some of the women of the town, tastefully keeping the intimate thoughts 
to herself. She is trying to show them how important and special this man is to her. And she does a very formidable job of convincing them about the wonder of her beloved companion. So again, we see here that she's sharing with others because you're, going, if you're in a relationship, you're going to have other folks trying to come in, try to deter you in your relationship. Some think they know somebody better for you. But if you love who God has blessed you with, you got to let these folk know that I love my spouse. I don't care what he will, and everyone, and think about all of us in here, especially adults. We all did some things when we were in sin that we are ashamed of. And many of you in here, after you got saved, that's when God blessed you with your spouse. Some people know what you did back in the day. And they would try to come and tell your spouse about your past. What you did back in the day. They may not know and fully understand that God has changed me. God has saved me. God has saved my spouse. Some people try to hold what you did in the past over you and use that against you in talking to your spouse about what you may have done in the past. But here we see that this woman, I'm quite sure she knew that Solomon was involved with many women in the past. But she talking about now. I love this man. This is who God blessed me with. Even though he, he may not be home right now. <laughs> and we don't know the details of the situation because we're not told. So you may want to assume something, but your, your whatever you're assuming may be wrong. But yet and still, this is the way that she feels. And as we read on down, we go into the next. We're not going to go into it today because of our time. But we're going to see what, what, what's going to happen as a result of this. But again, the point of the message today is for everyone who is involved in a marriage, there are going to be some times where there are going to be some little disputes, little di disagreements, and one thing you don't want to do is let outside people come in and influence your marriage. Because they will try to do it. Okay? See, so all these women here, they don't want to ask the question why you love them so much. She just looking, out there looking for them. Then here, here, here they come. Well, why you love him so much? Do you know how he was? He ain't nothing but a latest man. Yeah. So again, I hope everybody's learning. Those of you who are not in a relationship, this is something you can look forward to whenever you do get to that point of being married. These are some things you need to know. Again, marriage ain't all. I know marriage day, you the happiest day in your life. But you want to maintain that happiness. And every, every there's not a person that I know that get along with a person 100% all the time. Married or not married. I love my mother, senior pastor. Sometimes we disagree on sometimes. We never get to the point of disagreement when we fall out, though. That's what I'm trying to get. Whenever you are married, don't get to the point of disagreement where you're falling out. Sometimes I'm over at Senior Pastor High, and I need to go. I have to go home. <laughs> For 
I be done saying something I regret. <laughs> sometimes you in your marriage relationship, sometimes you have to go. David, I mean Solomon may need to get out the house for a minute. <laughs> Sometimes me had to get out the house for a minute. But I even, Solomon even said, go on top of the house. <laughs> Better be on top of the house than be in the house with a brawling woman. <laughs> so again, we thank God for the word today. We all learn it. Got about three more chapters to go. So y'all stick with me. I know that, again, it's not a traditional message because you don't hear this talked about in church. You don't hear these scriptures read in church. Most people, when they read it, they have to read it on their own. But I want to bring it to our attention and to our knowledge because I want everyone, whenever you do get in your serious relationship, I want it to last. Okay? Give me thank God for everyone. And at this time, you for viewing the Pentecostal Revival Hour telecast. We invite you to watch all of our telecasts. We're on Christian Television Network every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Our programs can also be seen on the Lizella Pentecostal Church Facebook and YouTube page. We invite you to be with us in our services. We're in three locations, Forsyth, Lizella, and Fort Valley, Georgia. We begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., followed by morning worship service at 11 a.m. Our Bible study classes are on Mondays and Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Join us for Sunday school and Bible study classes on Zoom. So again, thank you for viewing the Pentecostal Revival Hour telecast in Jesus' name.